I wonder if you would turn in your Bibles to that psalm that we read, Psalm 130. There the psalmist is acknowledging the failure of the Old Testament people of God. And he's even acknowledging his own failings and he's looking to God for his mercy. But the verse I want us to focus on, especially this morning, is verses 3 and 4, where we read this. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. Now we know that in these times of uh, the coronavirus, it looms large in many people's thoughts. And many have taken a great interest in figures and statistics, perhaps in ways that they haven't before. Some look daily at these matters to see what the latest number of cases is, perhaps cases in our local area or further afield. Some look to see how we compare to other countries. Some want to know what the R number is, the infection rate, what the seven day roll, rolling average is. Uh, solemnly, we have reported to us the number of deaths quite regularly attributed to the virus. Now, some statistics we may hear seem very unimportant and have very little interest to us. But this interest in the coronavirus statistics, of course, isn't just a sort of theoretical or academic thing. Many have started to realise that these figures have a great bearing upon them and their possible futures. And if the numbers go up again, it may well have an impact on our economy, on our education and the ability of us to travel if steps have to be taken again. But even with such numbers being of such interest and of such importance at this time, I wonder if there are also other numbers, if you like, another accounting that is going on which should really concern us. Numbers which have a bearing not just on our lives here and our experience here, but also on our eternal destiny. So our title this morning is this, What Counts With God? What counts with God? First thing I'd like to look at this morning is God's awareness. God's awareness. Our text says, if you, Lord, should mark, or if you like, make an account of iniquities, who could stand? The psalmist is very much aware that God is aware of him. God, if he chose to, could make an account of all of the psalmist's iniquities. God sees what he's doing and he knows what is going on in his everyday life. These things are known to God. And it's quite an amazing thing when we actually consider what the Bible tells us about God's awareness of the creation that he has made. God sees what we are doing. Some think that uh, God has just gone off, having made this world and the universe, he's just gone off and he's left it, and he's very disinterested, and he doesn't really have much awareness of what is taking place. And yet that is not what the Bible shows us. Peter, the disciple, is talking with Christ about paying the temple tax. And Christ agrees that so they should go and pay the temple tax and so he sends Peter to the sea and in Matthew 17 verse 27 he says this cast in a hook and take the fish that comes up first and when you have opened its mouth you'll find a piece of money take that and give it to them for me and for you what an extraordinary thing there is this fish Swimming in the Sea of Galilee, Christ said these words in Capernaum, which was close to the Sea of Galilee. And no doubt there are many hundreds, perhaps even thousands of fish swimming in that sea. Someone had dropped a coin at some point into the sea and eventually the fish has scooped it up. That fish that Peter would draw out of all the hundreds of fish, Christ knew that one would have the coin in its mouth. What an awareness, what a knowledge of his creation. But then we have the fact that perhaps we don't take much notice of sparrows. We've got a lot of noisy sparrows around our house. 
don't seem to get many other birds actually, but generally we perhaps don't take much notice of sparrows. They all look rather similar. In Israel, they were actually caught and cooked and eaten. They were considered of little worth. And yet Jesus says a wonderful thing. Matthew 10, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Amazing. Every sparrow that falls, whether it falls in the desert, whether it falls in the street, whether it falls in the jungle, God is aware of it. God sees it. God knows the falling of that sparrow. But then we can go further. Some of us don't have much of this, as much as we once did. With time, it seems to, with age, it seems to disappear. But Christ says to his disciples, he's reassuring them not to fear persecution because God is with them. And he says this, Luke 12, verse 17, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Amazing. God knows every follicle, every follicle of hair on our heads is known to God. But then in John's Gospel, we read of a man who's been born without sight. Christ tells him to go to the pool of Siloam and tells him to wash. Amazingly, by Christ's power, he's given sight. Every nerve, every nerve junction, every neurotransmitter, the ability of the retina, the ability of the muscles which make the eye work, all is known to Christ and is ordered and arranged and is under the control of the one who heals him. But then we can go even further. Christ is at a wedding in Cana of Galilee and his mother tells him they've run out of wine. Christ tells them to fill the water pots with water and yet when they pour it out they find the molecules which were H2O. Many of them have become C2H5OH. The one who could command such a thing that every molecule in that, those water pots obeyed his power what an awareness what a knowledge you see whatever the level we go to whether it's of molecules whether it's of the components of our bodies the creatures of the earth the planets the stars themselves we are told that there are billions of them yet we're told he counts all the stars he calls them by name he knows each individually and even if we were to hide ourselves so that no man or woman was aware of where we were. We went into the deepest cave, away to the furthest star, whether we went 2.4 miles down and sat on the prow of the Titanic. We might be hidden from men, but we would still be seen by God and known by God. Jeremiah 23, 23, can anyone hide himself in secret places so I do not see him? says the Lord. So you see, the Bible tells us such is God's knowledge of the one in whom we live and move and have our being, the one who holds our very breath in his hands. He knows everything about every atom of his creation. He knows everything about us. Some people scoff at this. They say, how can God know everything about everyone? Well, in our day, if the police need to check on someone's movements they can go and they can look at cctv and ampr and bank statements or bank interactions bank transactions and they can almost build up a minute by minute a second by second account of where we were and what we were doing yet some think that this is impossible for god for god to know everything my friend it should we should realize it's no problem for god to know these things if the God who has such power to call all things into being, to make all things, the stars and the planets and the earth and all that is in it, should we think it strange that he has such knowledge of every atom and every creature that he has made? Now, there are some things that are counted every day and they have little concern for us. Apparently, there are monitors which count the number of cars on the M27 motorway every day. It may not be of much interest to us unless we're going to travel on the motorway. But there is something which is being counted and God is aware of every day and which the psalmist here makes us aware of. So having thought about God's awareness, secondly, let's think about God's counting. God's counting. Our text says, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities 
O Lord, who could stand? As we said, the psalmist is aware here that God could keep an account, could keep an account especially of his iniquities. Many people like to live or to say today that really there are no absolutes. There are really no unchanging rules for life and for us. What they say was right a few years ago is no longer right now. Things have changed. And really they feel that very much morality is like the shifting sands that move around and are blown about by the wind. Things that were considered bad a few years ago are now even considered good. This is completely untrue. In fact, people can't and don't want to live in a world that is like that, where there are no absolutes. People want absolutes. They want things which they know to be true in their lives. Wherever we go in the world, wherever you travel, all know that it's wrong to steal. It's wrong to murder. It's wrong to take another man's wife. It's wrong to dis disrespect one's parents, to not show due respect to your parents. Everyone knows that. All societies acknowledge that. All will agree. Why is that? Is it because there was once a committee that from all the nations of the world that gathered together and said, let's agree what is right and what is wrong. No, it's not. It's because, you see, the Bible tells us man is made in the image of God. And so God has written his law on our hearts. We saw it in that reading that we had from Romans, Romans chapter 2. It declares to us, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law, they do not have a written law like the Jews did, the Ten Commandments, by nature do the things in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts. Here is a man, he does something bad. And he feels terrible for it. And yet the strange thing is, nobody else knows what he's done. And nobody else will ever know. Yet he feels terrible. Why is that? Well, it's because, you see, God's law is written on his heart. And it's screaming at him. It's raising an alarm. It's telling him his behaviour has fallen short of what is good and what is right. What God tells him is good and what God knows to be good and to be right. And what is more, the Bible assures us that this God, who has such an awareness of his creation, who's written his law upon our hearts, is aware when we commit iniquity. He's aware when we do wrong. He's able to mark it. He's able to take an account of it, you see. When we go against his commandments and when we do not keep his laws. This is what it says in the book of Proverbs. The eyes of the Lord are in every place keeping watch on the evil and the good. We can no doubt find a place where there's no CCTV. There's no a ANPR. Some may feel they've escaped the surveillance of men, yet we can never escape the surveillance of God. Perhaps the children here, perhaps the children, sometimes you can be very unkind to your brothers or sisters. And, you know, perhaps you pinch them or you push them, or you take something from them and you laugh at them because you've taken it from them and you rub it in. And when your brother or sister complains, you deny it. You say, I didn't do it. It's not true because mum and dad haven't seen it. Yet someone has seen it. God has seen it. God always sees it. God knows what you've done. God sees what you've done. When I was at school, I can remember being very disappointed in my school report. I don't know why, really, because I'd had one term where I had especially been drawn into mischief, especially in French. And I thought, well, my parents will never know. But then came the school report. And there it was in black and white. It wasn't good. It was a D for effort. It was there. The truth couldn't be hidden. The truth was known. What a shame. What an embarrassment. I was asked to explain, you see, I couldn't escape the facts of what had actually been going on. And so with God, you see, we feel, well, others don't know, or perhaps they don't know that we've done wrong. But God knows. God has a record. God sees. It's all there in black and white before God. 
He sees everything we're doing. And you know, really, if we look at our record, there aren't many A stars. There's lots of D's and lots of E's and lots of F's because everyone does iniquity. Everyone falls short of God's standards. Though many like to feel they're not that bad compared to others, we can always find somebody we feel that we can compare ourselves to and make ourselves feel that we're better than. But you know, really, the, the statistics, the numbers are not that good. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. There is no one righteous. No, not one. You see, the standard which is acceptable to God is this. We must love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and with all our strength and our neighbour as ourselves. But you see, not one of us does this. Not one of us ever gets anywhere near that standard. Loving God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. Loving our neighbour as ourselves. We love ourselves much more often than we love others. We're selfish. We put ourselves first. We do not put others or God first. We become jealous. We become envious of others. We want to see others being put down. We resent God's laws. We prefer to go our own way. We don't see the things of God, the way of God as being attractive. We rebel against it and we break God's laws. Do you know, we don't even keep our own standards, let alone God's. We don't keep the standards that we ourselves would impose on others. We don't keep our own standards, let alone God's. We get cross when somebody jumps a queue of traffic. They come hurling down and they force their way in and we think, what are they doing? Don't they know there's a queue? And yet we can find later, perhaps we take advantage in a certain situation. We sometimes take advantage. We jump the queue. We don't even keep our own standards, let alone God's. We all, you see, the Bible says, commit transgression and iniquity. So the psalmist is right when he speaks about those numbers and those statistics that God sees. And he says, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, if you, Lord, should take an account of iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? There is not a man or a woman, there's not a boy or a girl, here, in this building, or outside, who would pass the test if God were to call us up before him and to bring out the figures, to bring out the statistics and show us our record, we would be utterly unable to stand before God. Such is our failure and our guilt. I couldn't stand before God. If God showed me all my iniquities, I could not stand before God. No Christian, no true Christian would ever say that they could stand before God if he were to mark iniquities because they know that they fail God, they fall short of God's standard. Our estimation of ourselves, you see, is always wrong. Our estimation of ourselves, how we see ourselves, always falls far short of what it's really like. We know that the statistics with regard to the virus have had to be revised. And there's been some debate, and we would like to revise our own statistics, the numbers that concern us. We're never accurate, you see, in the way that we assess ourselves. Some still say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. I've never robbed. I've never killed anyone. I'm generally quite a nice person. Well, friend, it may be that God has given you much by way of his common grace. But, you know, it's a bit like a child comparing school reports with another and saying, you know, I'm sure my report is much better than yours. And yet they get at home and they still, when they open it up, they find that still there's many D's and there's many E's there on the report. They fall far short of what they should be. Do you love God with all your being? Do you gladly keep all God's commandments? Is your mind and your attitude those which rejoice to do what God wants? You see, there's no hope trying to convince ourselves that what the psalmist says is not true for us, just for us. We just happen to be the person who actually is not included in this particular verse. 
that the numbers and statistics aren't that bad as far as we're concerned. The Bible says there is no one righteous, no, not one. We have all gone astray. We all fall far short of the standard which God has given. And really in our hearts we know that, that is so because our consciences tell us it is so. That's why we are troubled sometimes because you see there is this standard that God has given and he's written it upon the heart of every person who has ever lived. We really know in our hearts that we don't meet the test. We can't pass the test. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? We know that we wouldn't stand, really, if we're honest with ourselves. And yet, wonderfully, not only does the psalmist show us here how hopeless the numbers are, our numbers are, how hopeless the case is, if God were to call us to account for all our iniquities, if God were to number our iniquities, the psalmist also shows us the wonderful truth, thirdly, of God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. We're without hope as we are before God. None of us can stand if God were to bring an account, an accounting of our failure and of our sin. And yet what an incredible word this is. It's really the message of the whole Bible. There is forgiveness with God. What an amazing thing. There is the forgiveness of sins with God. We can be forgiven. What an incredible thing. How is it that God can forgive us? Do we try and plead our own goodness or things we feel that God should accept and hope that somehow that the good might outweigh the bad? That's what many people feel Christianity is all about. It's really about people trying to get into God's good books, trying to put enough good things in one side of the scales. You know, imagine an old set of scales that go up and down. They're on a beam and there's two pans and you weigh things. You see how things compare. And if you put enough in the good side, it might just outweigh the bad. That's how, what people think Christianity is. True Christianity is nothing like that at all. Some people think that, well, perhaps if I do enough good, God will let me off. It's a bit like a criminal who's committed armed robbery, cr committed great violence, stolen much. And he says to the judge, look, he says, OK, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, I'm, I'm guilty. I'm bang to rights on that. But can't you just remember that I've given to charity on many occasions during my life? I've adopted a pet dog. I've helped old ladies across the road. Surely that gets me off. Well, of course it wouldn't, would it? And it's the same with us. We feel that our good things that we can do will somehow get us off. All that we try to do by way of good cannot change our record. It cannot clear our record of the iniquities that God has seen or put them right. Mm. There's only one way that God can deal with with us and show us his mercy and our iniquities can be dealt with. God must forgive us. But when God forgive us, forgives us, does he just ignore our sin? Does he just sort of sweep it away? And does he just sort of say, well, I'll just leave it. I, I won't bother about what you've done. No, God can't do that, you see. God cannot do that because, you see, God can only forgive if the demands of his justice and of his holiness are fully met. And the record of our sins, those things that we've done wrong, that he is aware of and that he knows, is fully addressed. And justice is seen to be done to that record, which we have. So how can God forgive? How can that be done? Well, it's through the cross. It can only be done through the cross. And that's where it's so costly, this forgiveness. It's very costly. There is the wonder of the cross of Jesus Christ. Wicked men hated the Son of God. And yet behind it all was God's plan. God in his mercy and love sends his Son to the cross. It was no ordinary death. There was that terrible cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was going on? 
The terrible darkness at noon. We're almost at noon now. Imagine suddenly three hours of darkness, so dark we couldn't see. What was going on? Well, there he who knew no sin was made sin. There the Son of God took the punishment, the guilt, the condemnation. He took the guilt of all those iniquities that were being accounted to those who will believe upon him. The wrong things they had done, the things they should have done that they didn't do, the things they did do that they shouldn't have done, sins of their thoughts, sins of their mouths, sins of their deeds, their actions, sins of their attitudes, sins of the past, sins of the present, sins of the future, all were marked to him, all were accounted to him, all were laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who knew no sin was made sin. All the bad numbers were stacked up against him. There at the cross, there was this incredible exchange. The one who knew no sin was made sin. He was treated as if he were guilty of all those sins. They were all accounted to him, all marked up to him. Some deny there is such a thing as sin. My friend, look at the cross. Look at the cross of Jesus Christ. There is the clear fact of sin, that sin is real, iniquity is real. There are absolutes. God has a standard. We fall short. And God is a God who hates sin and must punish sin. But you see, there God's justice was satisfied. God's justice was satisfied. The record of our sins was dealt with. And so now you see, God can forgive. God can forgive without having to ignore his justice or his holiness. And he's willing now to forgive all those who look to Jesus Christ and trust in him, the one who died on the cross. There's only one way that our iniquities and our sins can be dealt with and we can know the wondrous forgiveness of God, that all our iniquities, whether sins of the past, sins of the present, even the sins of the future, have been dealt with and have been put away. That the record, if you like, has been cleared. Do you know there are those here who know this? There are those here this morning who know this is true because you see they have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. They've looked to him and they've been brought into this wonderful peace with God. This wonderful sense of God's acceptance and of God's love. And they truly know God. And if you ask them why it is, they wouldn't say, well, it's because I've tried to be a good person or I've done this or I've done that. They'd say it's all because of Jesus. All because of what Jesus did. All because Jesus died for me. All because of the fact that he is my saviour. It's real, it's true. It's a wonderful experience. It's the thing we need to know above all things. To know peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, what of you this morning? What of you, dear friend, this morning? Have your sins been dealt with? Do you know peace with God? Do you enjoy the fellowship of God? If God were to mark your iniquities, if God were to bring an accounting of all your sins today and bring it before you, where would you be? The list is long, you know. The list is growing every day. The list is getting longer and longer. One day, if you do not come to Christ, you will be shown it. There on the last day, the books will be opened and it will be seen quite clearly, as plain as day, the fact that there is this long list of your iniquities which God is aware of, God has seen, and God is angry with. And yet this God is willing to forgive. He's willing to forgive. There is forgiveness with you. This God is willing to forgive. To wipe away the long list of transgressions against you. If you would but look to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him. It's more important, you know, than the coronavirus. To get right with God. It's more important than being spared from the coronavirus, really, in many ways. Because, you see, if we're not right with God, it can have an eternal effect upon us. It may be that the coronavirus will ultimately, as we say, we don't know how it might affect us, do we? But we could recover. But... If we don't get ourselves right with God, we'll never recover if we leave this life and go off into eternity. It's lovely there are those who come to know his mercy. They've come to know the mercy of God. They've come to know his forgiveness. They've come to know him 
been brought into this relationship with God because, you see, he's forgiven them, he's taken their sins away, and they have been put right with God. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you might be feared. They've come to know God, they've come to love God, and yet they've come to fear God. Now, it's not this slavish fear of judgment. They have this awe, they have this respect, this high view of God, you see. Though their sins of the past, the present and the future have all been forgiven, they cannot sin freely now because they live a new life and love is in their hearts. And they have such a high regard of God. They have a fear of God, an awe of God, because they realise what this great God has done for them, just who he is and what he's done. Oh, he's holy. He's glorious. He's righteous. He's just, and yet he's so loving. He's so gracious, he's so kind. Oh, they fear him, they love him. It's a fear which is combined with love and awe and respect that is combined with a love for God. And their aim now is to, con to please him. That's their concern, their desire, if they're a true child of God. Oh, that you would come to see the wonderful work that God has done, the wonderful way of forgiveness through Christ. The charge sheet that is against you at the moment, if you're not his, the charge sheet is long. Many iniquities, God knows of them. And yet there is forgiveness with God. If you would but turn to Christ, it can only be removed through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Wonderful the psalmist can speak there of a God who shows mercy. He's willing to show you mercy. If you will but come to him. He's a God who redeems. He's a God who is willing to show us his redemption. In other words, he's a God who's willing to... He's paid the price. The Lord Jesus Christ has paid the price. He's redeemed his people. And we can know his wonderful salvation if we would but come to him. Oh, may none of us feel that we can ignore this. Ignore the fact there is an all-seeing God. We never escape him. He sees all that we do. He sees our iniquities. He has a record of our iniquities. We need to have that record dealt with. It can only be dealt with through the God who forgives and through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's willing to forgive us. May none of us feel we don't need that forgiveness. May we realise it's our greatest need to come to Christ, to know his salvation, to know his love, and to know this wondrous peace with God. May it be the experience of every one of us here. May none of us harden ourselves against this God and against this Saviour. If we're not his, may we go home today and cry to him, Lord, save me. Lord, show me your forgiveness. Show me your mercy. I'm looking to Christ. I'm willing to submit to Christ. Lord, just give me salvation. And may it be that many, us, many of us are brought from death into life, out of darkness, into his marvellous light, for his name's sake and for his glory. Amen.